brothers, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this special lecture this evening at Blackfriars, and my honour to be able to introduce Professor Pellegrino. He has the most extraordinarily distinguished academic record. He is Professor Emeritus of Medicine and Medical Ethics at the Centre for Clinical Medical Ethics at Georgetown University. He has served as the Chairman of the President's Council on Bioethics <coughs> in Washington. He's a former director of the Kennedy Institute of Ethics, a founding editor of the Journal of Medicine and Philosophy, and, well, the list goes on and on. But I would like to supplement an extraordinary list of academic endeavour if I might just quote from an email from a friend of mine who knows the professor and who says he is indescribably good as he would expect from a knight of the Holy Sepulchre. <laughs> Eminent Catholic physician, philosopher and gentleman, always with a twinkle in the eye. He says, there must be some Irish in that Italian-American blood. <laughs> so it is our very great delight to welcome you, Professor, to Blackfriars, to Oxford. I think I'm right in saying it is the first time that you have lectured in Oxford. And we apologise that it has taken us so long. <laughs> but we very much look forward to what you will be saying to us tonight on such crucial, life-concerning issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father Ben. Very gracious, and I might say, a very, very much touched with Christian charity introduction. <laughs> Uh, I'm not any of those things that nice people point out, but uh, every once in a while, as you get to be my age, people begin to feel a little bit benign and begin to <clears throat> talk about it. Some one aspect that may have seen that was a, a more gentle side. I do appreciate the opportunity to come here, and I hope this evening I can discuss the subject of your interest. Now, I'm going to put some blame on Father Finn. I have the unfortunate characteristic always of asking when I'm invited to speak what topic the audience might be interested in. So speaking on your behalf, and I'm sure I'm not consulting with you, Paul Finn chose the question, can Catholic bioethics be an academic discipline? Now, ordinarily, one would say that sounds like a very, very uh, if not an interesting, at least rather mundane kind of topic. But I responded very well because in the United States today, which is the only country to which I will limit my remarks, in the United States today, Catholic bioethics, something that Catholic is part of, is marginalized. As a matter of fact, in much of the debate, it's even disenfranchised. And from more and more directions, we get the comment, you took that position because you were Catholic, ergo, it is not admissible in the debate. I have not made that up for your delectation, but it is an actual fact. So I thought when you chose that, it was a very relevant, relevant topic. The second question that derives from that is, well, of course, isn't your argumentation really a form of sophisticated religious prejudice? And that's another reason for its inadmissibility. Lest you think I'm exaggerating, I can tell you that uh, some people, my good friend, Knows, others you I know in my country uh, will immediately 
return to that way of doing things. Happily, it does not happen at the Kennedy Institute where uh, there are only two Catholics, John Keown, who is your own, and also uh, myself. Well, I want to address the question, and I will do so in the following way. I will argue that Catholic politics can be, not necessarily is, a true university discipline. And I want to argue, in addition, that it has a special role to play in our emerging post-secular society. I'm using that terminology with His Holiness Benedict XVI has used recently to signify that society we're entering into in which religious points of view, religious worldview, and the secular worldview are increasingly living together, must live together, and clearly must establish some kind of relationship to each other. Throughout my remarks, I will be trying to speak in the spirit of a very small, but I think very potent, dialect between Gautama and Pope and the 16. Some of you perhaps have seen it, perhaps all of you have seen it. But here we see two people, one who admittedly is tone deaf to religion and religious overtones, and one who obviously represents the spiritual dimension, the leader of the Roman Catholics in the world. And I cannot go through that dialectic except to say I'll give you one or two quotations, it's not going to be my focus, but it's in the spirit of that dialectic. And it's one which I have experienced personally in my long life in bioethics. I think it may be true that I am the oldest living person uh, who has participated in bioethics for uh, not all my 90 years, but a good part of them. Doing other things as well, since I need to do honorable work as well as uh, speaking in my way. Now, I want to talk, therefore, about A, the fact that Catholic bioethics is an essential component in the coming dialectic, and I'm using dialectic and not dialogue. This is not the psychologization of ethics. It's a dialectic in the ancient Greek sense of the word, not simply talking together, but talking together in a very direct way, which is critical, examining each other's positions. And I want to hold that that Catholic bioethics has a special role to play in the post-secular society, and that, in addition, that particular approach, if it does not was exiled from the university, which is what some people have been thinking of doing, if it's exiled, all of humanity loses a great deal. Now, with this audience, the major premises, I think, probably don't need to be argued too strenuously, but I do think I want to lay out how, in fact, <coughs> I do carry out this dialogue with those who disagree with us. I'm going to proceed in the following way. First, I want to define how I will use my key terms. <coughs> Second, I will outline the history. Just a brief one, don't worry, I won't go back to the Middle Ages. I will outline the history of the factiousness of bilateral discourse today, how it got to be where it is. Again, remember when I'm speaking about the United States, I suspect this kind of uh, disorderly behavior doesn't occur here in England. <laughs> I suspect, I don't know. <laughs> and third, I want to examine the re reasons why the methods by which question rationalism and religious worldviews must engage in effective 
that dialect. And that that dialect is impossible without the presence of Catholic bioethics on the university campus. Well, first with the definitions. Catholic ethics is not always, but it can be an academic discipline. I hope you'll you lay the obvious with this group, but nonetheless, it is after all a branch of Catholic bioethics, it's a branch of ethics. And ethics, I hope you will all agree, is a very ancient and credible discipline, a systematic, orderly, organized, and critical examination of right and wrong human conduct with respect <coughs> to human behavior and human conduct in all its manifestations. It has a method, the critical method of ethics, a body of knowledge, a body of professionals, trained professionals, it's organized in societies, and it publishes in journals for the critical appraisal of all who would wish. I think by that definition, it's hard to say it is not an academic discipline. Now, it's Catholic, plus being bioethics, and it carries with it its connotations and presuppositions of theological nature within the background of moral view does not per se, however, disqualify it, and that is a major premise of those who argue against us, in any way, any more than secular bioethics is disqualified by its presumptions of skepticism, relativism, Cartesian or Baconian rationality to most a few. We still remember the posterior analytics, every line of argument, however far it goes in the future, begins with some axiomatic, unprovable premise. The definition of post-secular age. All of us, I know, tire a bit of the lumping together of ages. Post-modern, post-conciliar, post-Christian, post-this, post-that, post-breakfast, post-lunch. <laughs> Get these rubrics do have some discursive value. Post-secularism refers to what is daily becoming a fact, that neither red religion nor positive rationality will prevail over the other, and that they are doomed, if you will, destined, if you will, to live into the future together. And this will be especially important about the dialogue that's intensifying, intensifying the one which is the greatest division, and that is on the human life issues. I don't think I need to define those for this group. But a major point here is that bioethics, because of the nature of its subject matter, and if it's faithful to its methodology, is at the juncture point between the secular and the worldview of, of religion, of theology, on what is good and bad about our applications of biology and technobiology to human affairs. Let it be said here earlier that I am a physician. I am not a philosopher, obviously not a theologian, and I am not a bioethicist. I'm a physician who simply likes to reflect at moments of, uh, shall I say, intellectual weakness, perhaps, on matters ethical as a debate and philosophical to medical practice. I still see patients if there are any physicians here, and so I have not lost my plastic card, which admits me to the physician's bathroom. <laughs> All right. I'm going to proceed this way under those rubrics. But I'm talk, talking a little bit of the fractiousness of today's bioethics. And let me start with a little bit of the history. Bioethics 
came into being sort of quietly in the mid-60s, despite what some of the historians of this particular period have said, who haven't lived through it, began as a movement which had very strong religious background, at least in the United States, where I think we may gain the honor or the dishonor of having nurtured this young discipline. Started by a group of campus ministers who were concerned with the fact that they thought the direction in which medical education was going were too technical and took the young physicians and the older ones too far away from the human dimensions of the physician-patient interaction. Incidentally, when I'm lecturing on the philosophy of medicine, my approach is to the physician-patient interaction phenomenologically. I won't do this for you to see it. But these campus ministers joined together a very small group and expressed their concerns. And those concerns were supported by the United Presbyterian Church of America. For those of you who are not of the Catholic persuasion. It's a very interesting. They supported it because they believed that in addition to this question of the humanizing of the medical curriculum, there was a question of bringing back into a closer relationship to human values. To what it was to be sick, to be healed, and to offer to heal, and what the obligations would be of that interpersonal Reaction. That was the origin of bioethics. In that early period, it was propagated and moved into an intellectual realm by three patriarchs. Patriarchs were one of them, a Roman Catholic and a Jesuit as well, Richard McCormick. Second was James Gustafson, Protestant, and the third was Paul Ramsey, Protestant. I spent some time on this because you will encounter those who say, well, contemporary bioethics is precisely not religious in any of its way. In any case, I won't go on now with the history of bioethics to say that the origins were religious. I'm a professor of philosophy at Georgetown as well as medicine, so I'm not running any philosophers down here, but the philosophers entered the game in about the mid-60s, and, as was appropriate for them, began to apply analytic methods and methodologies to these assertions of the religiously oriented founders of the field and began to introduce the notion that the ethics could not have intellectual credibility unless it was the expression of a formalized, organized, recognized philosophical system. Ergo, the ontology, utilitarianism, a variety of ethical propositions of the past were introduced into these questions. At first, the questions were relatively simple. How do doctors and patients relate to each other and what was wrong with that relationship in terms of autonomy, justice, beneficence, and non-maleficence? I'm not running that down. That's the Georgetown mantra. I've been with it for most of my professional life. But, it's not just that, it was the whole view of the of Kantian deontologism, etc., etc., etc. That put a particular cast on the endeavor of bioethics. 
as primarily a philosophical discipline and one which had to fit one or two or some combination of established ethical theory. <coughs> Footnote, my own contribution to this is that I believe, and perhaps many of you here will thoroughly disagree, that the philosophy of medicine, qua medicine, is derivable from the nature of the physician-patient relationship of what medicine is, as you know how popular that is these days. So we'll leave it aside, but the point is, there is a current in the opposite direction as well, being developed at the present time. Bioethics then became interdisciplinary, which is natural and which is always encouraged, and was able to draw on virtually all the social sciences. However, this movement began to dilute the ethical component. <clears throat> so that now, today, we have bioethics as a discipline, which is only what I'm talking about at the moment today, which has a variety of perspectives, does not have especially a philosophical or theological notion, and is running into the fact that <coughs> past assertions, past history, past traditions were all to be looked at and re-examined critically and often removed from consideration. Having made this point, just to add one more and then I'll finish with my first part, which is the history. And that one more uh, edition is, of course, the fact that in the mid-60s in America and in the rest of the world, we were exposed to a social revolution. One which I like to think, in my own mind, it was a recrudescence of the fever of the Enlightenment. And that fever manifested itself in a further and more forceful rejection of any received wisdom, any uh, application to authority, any uh, reliance on uh, traditional ways of looking at medicine, at the relationship between the physicians and medicine, and at the deeper <coughs> fundamental moral questions like abortion, euthanasia, etc., which I should refer to as the human life issues, all put up for grabs. And the mood of that social revolution was change, change almost for change's sake, and we were presented, therefore, with a re-examination of the whole of the ethics that related to the physician and to medicine. We'll be out of this in a moment. Medicine came first under observers because it was a channel through which the amazing changes, unprecedented powers of biology and biotechnology were funneled through the physician. We're talking now about the mid-70s. Bioethics had its formal baptism in 1972, and my good friend Warren Reich in his book, Cyphopedia, asserts that with some degree of hoarseness, 1972, at Georgetown and at the University of Wisconsin, and today there's still banter back and forth about who administered the baptismal, uh, I won't say sacrament, but at least the designation that your name is by that. All right. Now, what <clears throat> came out of that? My good friend Tristram Engelhardt, who to my mind, at least to the American side, is the most astute and well-educated of the bioethicists, and he's really not that either, 
philosopher of medicine. But Emmerhart pointed out with great concern that what was happening was happening in such a way that it was never going to be possible to develop a common set, a common worldview, a common content for bioethics, which could be used as a mode of discussion for those who want to question. So he said, apodictically, we will never be able to communicate across these boundaries, the boundaries of our presuppositions and the fact that we cannot, because of our divergence of values, particularly those that came out of the revolution of the 60s, the social revolution, we could not converse with each other. And therefore, there'd be no possibility except within the framework of your own set of values to have a discussion that was productive. He used the picturesque term, moral strangers. And we would be moral strangers forever. Out of that, and this history, developed the fractiousness of bioethics, which we see today. I'm laying the pathway for a response to your question in more fullness. Before doing so, however, we did come upon, by action and not by deliberation necessarily, one way to bring together these opposing forces, which in the part I think the director diagnosed, would not merge. That which was based in a perspective on the world, which was consistent with a religious perspective, that there was a source of morality, believe it or not, on who we are and what we are, and the growing view that there was no such source and that we were the determinants of our own morality and that we set the rule. Now it was clear that if you took those two positions, it was very difficult to find how we would agree or disagree. To even know why and how and to what extent, because you would say there was nothing to be heard of on the other side. So bioethics became a discipline that fell into the hands of related fields to its disciplinarity, and we began to have the resolution of ethical issues of sociology, psychology, anthropology. Nothing wrong with the infiltration of these disciplines in the dialogue or in the dialectic even, but to declare them as the end was more than I think some of us could accept, certainly those of us of Catholic or religious persuasion. Nonetheless, I think if you look at it now, these questions have been, at least in the United States, translated into the public realm, into the public arena. Being a democracy, we have come to the conclusion that Democrats sometimes come to, that the will of the majority, almost in a Rousseauistic sense, the rule of the majority would settle the moral question. In 1972, it was the settling of the abortion question by the decision of the Supreme Court of the United States. At that point, law became ethics. What was real was ethical. And the further consequence
conscience was clear. Your conscience was not to stand in the way of the majority principle. Interestingly, Alexis de Tocqueville, who many of you perhaps know, back in the 19th century, 1832, 42, about there somewhere, made this observation, two observations. One, he said that rarely does it occur that a disputed question in America does not end up as a judicial question. And we are, the trajectory is moving in that direction. I suspect it's moving in yours as well. I read the newspaper this morning, and I gather that sex education at age five uh, is uh, advised. It starts out by talking about parents having the liberty of not subscribing. But it also, I can tell you, as you're wiser than I am, I'm sure, you understand that that is going to be somehow pressured or changed or modified. Because after all, these little <coughs> children need to know about sex. Okay. I won't argue that point, but I'm arguing here is the imposition of a moral problem, that is the obligation of parents to children as a legal problem, and so we run into what happens, the tyranny of liberalism, which is just as bad as the tyranny of conservatism. And liberals and conservatives, when they're in their most apathetic moods, always meet together like that. <laughs> so, where do we go now? Well, what option are open to us? There was one option that has worked reasonably well. And I'm not suggesting this is the option we should follow, which is the way I want to just put it. They're all familiar with it. Series of international agreements on the rights of man, starting in 1929, going to the UN Declaration on Human Rights, going to the Declaration of the UNESCO uh, Commission on the Shadows of Member, uh, on the <clears throat> dignity of the human person being the first dignity of bioethics. bioethics. And, having participated in the debate, I was interested to see what had already been described much better by Jacques Maritain, what happened in 1946-7. And that is that people focused on what they could agree upon. So when they looked at dignity, they didn't look at or fight about the metaphorical foundations of dignity which is, of course, of prime importance, but focus on the fact that, well, somehow, human beings, by virtue of being human beings, were entitled to a certain amount of respect. And that went for all human beings. Somehow, they were able to get that through. On the UNESCO committee, it was not that easy, and I'm not going to regale you with the uh, positions on that point of view, but we did it finally uh, succeed in getting the dignity of the young person put first. Just so you can see how far this discussion had gone, the first proposition was that dignity should be a feature of all living things in the biosphere. And I'm afraid with my Jesuit training, I said, well, you mean to tell me that uh, the earthworms deserve the same kind of dignity as humans? And the answer was yes. And I'm sure you know what quarter of the world's point of view they came from. Well, we didn't want to be nasty about this, so we simply said, but shouldn't we perhaps look at which of the many, many creatures in the biosphere can intentionally, with plan, with expectations, 
and being responsible modified by her actions the biosphere. And I finally succeeded with that argument, which was not religious, but for those of you who I'm sure recognize the covert question that I was raising, it was accepted. But to go to those extremes, we're going further and beyond that. So, but that was what Engelhardt called the agreement and forbearance method. I think he entitled it properly. Agreement to suspend the arguments about the metaphysical foundations and the ideological foundations of one position for the benefit of a practical decision which did not involve necessarily a compromise of the premise, for the premise had never been discussed. We can all agree that humans should be respected. That was the kind of attitude. Now that has certain virtues and has been used in a variety of different situations in international bioethics. However, it would happen that that kind of approach is much more difficult at the personal level and it is beginning to lose its force for several reasons. I just look at those before we move on to where I think you know I'm going. First of all, the bioethicists now involved in these kinds of discussions on the human life questions do not start from where can we agree what is the right thing to do in a apodictic statement. I believe, my belief, my value, not my argument, not my principle, not something that I will put up for grabs. I believe, and I can go through all of this. The point, first point here there is that most of the argument is not carried out in terms of a formal ethical disputation of an argument. And the counter the other argument by saying, well, those are your values, and these are my values. And how do we meet in the middle? Values language came in. And I know that those of you who recognize the importance of a genuine axiology, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the kind of discourse which is in the public realm and which is making it extremely difficult to arrive at any common agreement on such important questions as affect the life of human beings. So that's the fractiousness of bioethics and the attempts that are made to reduce it. I think that the Engelhardian label is a good one, that many of these discussions can be looked at without compromise of principle or compromise of some fundamental belief that would be immoral for us to agree to if one looked at the practical and did not go beyond that. However, I think we're now in a position where the erosion of the validity of that kind of approach is apparent. I mentioned one, the change in the nature of the people are involved. Very few of the people involved now have a history or sense of history. They are the products of the social revolution of the 60s and therefore do not see the necessity for a diplomatic approach or an approach that would work for what can be dissected free, what can be agreed to and what cannot be agreed to without loss of personal integrity or of conscience. There are now the question of is there anything further we can do? Are we at a point 
in this post-secular world now we're not learning, where the religious <coughs> and the religious perspectives are going to exist side by side. I think that's clear. Every time I talk around and get into any involvement, it's very, very clear that we come to an impasse on the question of whether there is or is not any source of morality outside of the young man. An old question, to be sure, a very live question now, now in the political realm, and being resolved here and there by law, which raises the other question of the gentleman de Tocqueville, that Frenchman was very observant. He was very, very concerned that in our democracy, as it was going even in 1842, he was concerned about the fact that the rule of the majority might someday come to contact with the personal liberty of the individual citizen. I leave it to you to determine whether that's coming. On the other hand, if you do not have such a thing as a law of the majority, then chaos awaits you at the other side. We face a very, very serious true dilemma in the sense that if you choose one, you cannot choose the other. What do we do? Well, I think, and this relates now to the full term, relates to the place of Catholic bioethics, Catholic bioethics, in the dialogue as a respected discipline, as an academically respected discipline. <coughs> and the one that the father is concerned about, that I am concerned about. I refer back again, and I'm not going to go into detail, to that dialogue between Benedict XVI and Ugin Hobbes. I was surprised, and pleasantly so, that there was, and they pointed to, some fundamental ways to proceed. Let me summarize what they said out of their own words, which are more eloquent than anything I could put forward. Just two quotations. Here's Jürgen Hammelmoss, committed atheist, liberal, and a person says, from this point of view, he's religiously toned up. He was that tone up. The expectation, this is Hammelmoss, that there will be continuing disagreement between faith and knowledge deserves to be called rational. And when secular knowledge, only when secular knowledge grants that religious convictions have epistemological status that is not purely irrational. And if it is not purely irrational, at least it's admissible into rational discourse which is what I suppose universities are about. And I believe they are about. Benedict. I would speak of a necessary relatedness between reason and faith and between reason and religion, which are called, both of them, to purify and help each other. Can you imagine? They need each other, and they must help each other. In their dialectic, they elaborate on these points, and I'm not going to do that this evening. I merely want to point out an entry point open. Now I will say, how many Habermasers and how many Benedicts are there who have the goodwill 
and the intelligence and the intellect and the historical background to enter into this discussion. Well, I would raise the question, not many, clearly, but is this not a potential reason why we need Catholic emphasis, bioethics, national discourse on university campuses. It's difficult to imagine a productive relationship envisioned in the dialect between Habermas and Benedict without the academic presence of Catholic bioethics. If we ever are to overcome the barriers of the situation of moral strangers described by Engelhardt, universities must play a leadership role in sustaining the requisite discourse. To label reasoned approaches that look to theology and classical philosophy or ethical issues as off-limits is to ignore some of the most serious question. Now I'm going to tell you what you all know. But I'd like you to put you to put what you all know in the light of this inspiring kind of dialogue and how do we translate that to more ordinary levels of discourse. To label reasoned approaches that look to theology and classical philosophy <clears throat> as off limits ignores some of the most serious questions. To assume, on the other hand, that the secularized perspective is unwarranted, given the history of the world and the history of bioethics in particular, this emergence of its congruence and confluence of the social revolution of the 60s, would also carry us in the wrong direction. The issues relevant to Catholic bioethics may well be considered closed by the Western rational perspective as they are. That view is gaining support from increasing members of the general public as well. What you need to do is turn on the television set. Nevertheless, the great number of Americans and almost half a billion people in the world should, if they're not, be dismayed and more than puzzled if the cognitive moral questions and bioethics, those grounded in religious beliefs, were banished from responsible, learned discourse. What are some of those things? We're coming to conclusions. So, for those of you who appear in Solomon's, and I'm a physician, therefore I notice it, some of you are having difficulty because. The blood is pooling around your ischial tuberosity. It's <laughs> being drained from the, uh, by the way, uh, the gentleman who devised that term, Sir William Oster, who was your uh, professor of Oxford, of medicine here in Oxford, the Regis professor, the greatest English speaking physician of the last century. But in any case, if we exclude Catholic bioethics from academia, we deprive the university community as a whole of contact with the Philosophia Perennis, or a bad word, well, I'm going to use it. The longest continuing repository of philosophical and ethical reflection dating from contemporary, from ancient times, the Middle Ages as well. This is not to suggest that immediate answers to contemporary problems are thereby ready for picking out of the perennial force as it goes by the cafeteria approach, which is what everybody uses today. I like that, but I don't like that. Rather, it affords the ethicist an insight into what ideas have flourished, how they've been looked at, how they've been argued, thought about, how they have flourished, how have they have disappeared, some have died and some of which might enrich contemporary thought. Even more importantly, those who call themselves strictly non-religious, non-traditional, 
ethicists use those concepts over and over again. Again, for this audience, I don't believe I need to delay, tailor those off. Now, on that continuum, the exchange of ideas between religion and rational ideas is a constant feature in the philosophy of religion. Again, the aim is not easy in coming at formulations of agreement with the non-subscribing world. However, fruitful ideas are often embedded in those thoughts. So they fall in out of fashion and are freshly innovated and innovated by what's happening in the biological sciences, raising questions that need to be re-examined with a methodology which has been fruitful. It's not the only methodology, but fruitful. There's an array of concepts crucial to any credible moral philosophy that are currently interpreted solely in naturalist terms and therefore insufficiently. For each of these concepts, the rationalist, naturalist interpretations are important to consider. This is what Benedict is telling us. Let's look at them. Let's examine them. Let's not reject them at all. But so too are the ways they were interpreted by philosophers and theologians in the Catholic moral tradition of the past. I refer here to such concepts as a crucial look again at philosophical anthropology, those things that have to do with dignity, mind, spirit, self, virtue, etc. Of late, these concepts have received much attention from psychologists neurophysiologists and phenomenologists. Our human experiences of those concepts have been expanded thereby. But these more rational approaches do not exhaust the human experiences of the millions who factor religious factors and elements into their understanding of life and what it is to be human. Exile in Catholic bioethics ignores the 500-year-old history of Catholic efforts in bioethics per se. I have to keep reminding people that bioethics, that is to say the consideration of ethical issues having to do with the application of biological, physiological knowledge, is at least 500 years old, as all of you know, in the Catholic tradition. It's always astounding. The church encouraged these studies. There's another medical morality, pastoral morality for the care of the sick, etc. etc. But for one who is holding utility. Even if one disagrees with the results in ethical positions, questions have an intellectual history. An intellectual history.